Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the privilege of being able to be here this morning and sharing God's word with you. I'm so happy that we don't have to do this in front of computer screens anymore, that we're able to actually gather in person. Amen. God is good. Yes. This text that I picked for the opening text, Romans chapter 8. Paul has a list of all the things that cannot separate us from the love of God that's found in the Son, Christ Jesus. I'd like to add one more to that list, and that Wesley did not see you coming. It's good to see you, brother. I'm liking it. You can add the word coronavirus to that list. Is that right? Yes. Not even a coronavirus can separate you from the love of God that's found in Christ Jesus. Is that right? Yes. Also remember this, that the coronavirus can't separate you and each other from the love of God that's found in Christ Jesus. Is that right? Yes. So realize that neither life nor death, nor anything, coronavirus included, can separate you from the love of God. The only thing that can do that, the only one that can do that, is yourself. Don't allow that to happen. Don't allow fear to separate you from the love of God. But also, don't allow things to separate you from Christian fellowship with each other. Very important. So, the message that God gave me for today is titled, Unfathomable Love. Do you all know what the definition of unfathomable is? That's not rhetorical. You can speak. It's okay. Anybody? Fathom is how you measure the depth of the sea. I like it. So unfathom, and a fathom is a measurement. Uh -huh. So unfathomable, you can't tell how deep it is. Exactly. And you can't measure it, right? Too far down. Too far down. So listen. So as she said, when it comes to water, it's impossible to measure the extent of it. God's love for you is impossible to measure the extent of. I want you to think about that and remember that. Also, uh, another word or a definition of unfathomable as an adjective is incapable of being fully explored or understood. Meditate on that for a minute. God's love for you is impossible to fully understand. And this is why you'll have all eternity to grasp the plan of salvation, God's love for you, His sacrifice for you, and for all the ages of eternity, we still won't come to a full and complete understanding that that revelation will keep getting clearer and more beautiful to us as the eons of time go on. And that we'll be able to stand in the very presence of God, cast our crowns at His feet, and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Praise be to Him, for truly He is worthy. That's the God you serve. The question is, is that how you see God? And do you understand how God sees you? That's what we want to look at this morning. One church father wrote, God loves you more in a moment than anyone could love you in a lifetime. Think about that. Right? Listen. Do you believe in God? Again, not a rhetorical question. Do you believe in God? Yes. Do you believe that He's real? Yes. Do you believe that He sent His one and only Son to die for you? Yes. Do you understand what that sacrifice truly cost God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And do you understand why He did it? The only reason why He did that is because of His love you. Listen, we're told from the Spirit of Prophecy that God would have sent His Son and His Son would have died if it was just for you. But God, as we're told in John 3, 16, what? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish. So who did Jesus die for? Everyone, right? As was mentioned in our Sabbath school class, the love that God has for His children is for all of His children. Yeah. Doesn't matter what your status is. Doesn't matter how good you are or how bad you are. God loves 
everyone the same. And you better be glad about that because it makes it evil, or an even level playing field so that no one is above another when it comes to your standing with God. God loves you and that will never change. C.S. Lewis wrote that though our feelings come and go, God's love for us does not. His love is constant, and it is forever and for eternity. We looked at John 3.16. Let's look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. John 4.16 says, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. What does it say after that? God. You understand that human beings can love. We can learn to love. We can learn to hate. Okay? But there's a difference between us and God. For again, we have the ability to love, but God is love. That's what makes up his character. That's what makes up his person. And that's why we are able to love because God put that in us. But do you understand what that means? That God is love. When God looks at you, when God sees you, he sees you in the eyes of eternal love. A love that was willing to risk everything he had. Do you understand that? We're told that God emptied the treasures of heaven when he sent his son Jesus Christ. And that in his son, in this one gift, all the treasuries of heaven were poured. Given to you and given to me. So that we could understand who God is, love God, and come close to him in a relationship that is deeper than anything you can experience here with another human being on earth. Do you believe that? Amen. The question is, is have you experienced that? It's one thing to say yes, amen, but it's another thing to actually experience that. That's what God wants for you. That's why God promised to give His Holy Spirit to us so that we can have that kind of intimacy with Him. Let's look at verses 18 and 19 of 1 John chapter 4. Well, let me finish reading 16. We have known and believed that the love of God, or that the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out what? Fear. When you look around at your world today, when you look around at this country, are you afraid? Because if you have a relationship with God, you should not be afraid because God will see you through whatever comes. But listen, if the events that are happening today cause you to fear, you will not have the strength to actually stand in the real time of trouble. Because I will tell you, brothers and sisters, this is not it. Okay? This is not it. All this is, is a wake-up call for God's people and God's church. Just get your eyes off of the world and put your eyes on Him. Okay? This is not the time of trouble. This is not even the beginning of the time of trouble. This is just one of many events that this earth has seen, but it's for the purpose of getting God's people to wake up, draw close to Him, put away your sins, and allow Him to work in you, a work that the world can see, and draw them close to Jesus Christ. So, Again, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made, what's that word? Perfect. Perfect in love. Do you guys want to be perfect? Yes. Seriously, the only ones that want to be perfect is this guy's, these guys over here, one person over on this side. Let me ask you a question. Does that word perfect scare you? Because it scares a lot of people. It should what you need to do is understand what that word means, okay? We look at that word perfect, it means that, and we think that it means, I'm never going to do anything wrong, 
ever again. And we look at that as if we have to do that in our own strength. And if we look at it that way, we'll never be perfect. Okay. But listen, what does the Bible say here about that word perfect? It uses that word with love. Right? Do you want to be perfect? Then learn how to love. This is why love has to start here first amongst the brethren before it can happen between us and the world. Okay? We have to learn to love each other inside here. And when we do that, then we can learn to love those who are outside there. Being perfect in the eyes of God has already been taken care of. That's what the gospel message is about. When Jesus died for the sins of the world, remember John 3.16, for God so loved the world, that in Christ, when God looks at you, He doesn't see your failings. He doesn't see everything you've done wrong in the past. When God looks at you, He sees His Son, Jesus Christ. In perfection. Now listen. I've done a lot of things bad in my life. But yet I know the love of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And when you hear that voice in your head that keeps reminding you of all the things you've done wrong in the past, whether it was yesterday or last week or 30 years ago, it's not the voice of God. It's not even the voice of your conscience. It's the voice of the devil. Amen. Right? Yes. Because it's the devil's job. He is called the accuser of what? Of the brethren. And he accuses them before God day and night. So when you hear those voices, you need to be able to distinguish between the voice of God, which is a voice that draws you in love, which is a voice that does not have fear associated with it, and then the voice of the devil which is a voice of condemnation, right? The devil wants to bring up your past. What does the Bible tell us that God has done with our sins? As far as the east is from the west. As far as the east is from the west. Now that's pretty far, right? You go out and you look at the sunrise on the ocean, and then you look at sunsets, pretty far. But if you also measure the distance from <laughs> this earth, to the sun, it's pretty far, correct? Then the depth of the sea. Okay, and in that depth of the sea, the very deepest part of the ocean, is there any light down there? No. Do you understand why God has placed your sins in that deep and dark place with no light at all? Because it's there so that it never has to be brought up again. Mm. Think about that. We all fear our names coming up before God in the judgment. But what does the Bible tell us? That love casts out all fear. If you are Christ, you have nothing to fear. The judgment is not something that we should be afraid of. The judgment is something we should look forward to. Do you know why? Because when, when the judgment is finished, then all of this is done. Christ can come back, and we can finally go home. Amen. So you realize, you're not going to get there till you get to that place where judgment is finished. Where does judgment start at? House of God. Very good, amen. It's not something we should fear. It's something we should actually look forward to. And it should be something that we should hasten that day. Because if we hasten that day, then we hasten the coming of Jesus Christ. Is that not what your hearts are burning for? Right? You look at your world. Do you like the way the world is today? I look at my country and I wake up every day and I see the news and watch maybe three minutes of it and say, I've had enough of that. But this isn't the country that I grew up in. It's crazy. But like I said, this is nothing compared to what's going to come. And if you can't get through this, God in His mercy will wait until you're ready to be able to get through what will come. I want God to come. The desire of my heart is I want to see Jesus come. And I want to be the kind of person that Jesus needs me to be so He can come. You can be that person if you allow His love to just work in you, grow in you. That's all He's asking. We look and say, well, we got all these rules, we got all these regulations, we got all these things that we do and we don't do. God is asking you one thing. 
love as I have loved. And if you can do that, then you'll be perfect. But you realize if you do that, you'll be keeping His commandments. Because His commandments are love. F.M. Lehman wrote, Could we with ink the oceans fill, and were the skies of parchments made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. That's how much God loves you. You understand that there is in the book of the Gospel of John, that John makes this statement, that if it were possible to write down everything that Jesus did, that all the books could not even be contained in this earth. <clears throat> Do you think that he was using hyperbole there? Just exaggerating a little bit? Think about that, because either he was just, you know, got caught up in the moment and, and was exaggerating, or what he said is true. Okay, now you need to realize, there are only less than 12, less than four dozen miracles that are written in the Gospels. It's probably three, less than three, okay? Do you think Jesus did more miracles than that? Oh, yeah. Old for Think about that. Do you think that the only thing Jesus did is what's contained in the Gospels? The Gospels are an outline of what Jesus did. Okay? Think about that. This is why we have the spirit of prophecy. And God bless His church with that gift of prophecy. If you take the desire of ages, how many pages is in that book? Okay? 600. That's... Okay, I'm not good at math, but it's not half of what's contained in the scriptures. But it's almost that. Okay, there's 1,700 pages from Genesis to the end of Revelation. 600 pages, think about that. And that's just one book. How many pages did Ellen White write in her lifetime? She's the most prolific. Okay, so over 100,000 pages of print. 100,000. And yet, even with that, you still can't contain everything that Jesus has done. As was said, we're told that he went through towns and villages and healed every single disease. You look at the lives that Jesus touched, and then you start to understand why, when his disciples were fully converted, they were able to go out and change their world in a very short period of time. Nothing has changed from their day to our day. They understood God's unfathomable love. They saw it on the cross and they saw it in person. The only difference is, is that we're looking back on that. They saw it and they were able, as they went forward, to proclaim it. But listen, people who didn't see it heard their testimony and believed and saw them give their lives for their love for this man, Jesus Christ. And we come to our day today, and God is still asking for that same kind of love and commitment from His people and from His church. And what should fire us up is an understanding of how much God loves us. Understand? And if we grasp that, if we start to see that, then it will change your entire view of the world, your entire view of God, and it will give you a joy that nothing else in this earth can give. Amen? Yeah. Again, the question is, is, have you experienced that? There's a song out, and the lyrics go, I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Let's look at verses 8 through 12. Romans 5, verses 8 through 12. This 
is one of my favorite groups of texts in the entire scripture. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love towards us, and that while we were still what? That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. When were we reconciled? When we cleaned up our act? When we decided that it was time to come to God? When were we reconciled to God? When we were still enemies. When we were still enemies and fighting against God. Okay? God was the one who took the initiative to reconcile us back to Him. And God still does that today. That is unfathomable love. If somebody came and killed your family in front of your eyes, would you be willing to die for that person? Would you be willing to sacrifice your life for them? Because that's what God did for you. That's what God did for me. That's unfathomable love. I read in the Adventist Review that after the war in Rwanda between the Hutus and the Tutsis, that when they were trying to bring reconciliation between the two groups and to the whole entire country, think about being the leader of the Adventist church in that country. And your job was to go back there and reconcile both groups who used to belong to your congregation. And in this story, the man that they chose had his entire family killed on church property. And when he went back there, because they gave him, their leadership called him, told him, this is what we want you to do, and God has shown us that you're the man to do this job. And when he went back to the church, and when he started to bring the people together, there were those who came to him and said, we know who killed your wife. We know who killed your children. And they come here. And he told them, I don't want to know. Don't tell me. And if you can't not tell me, then you need to go. I don't want to know. Because I can't handle it. What God has called me to do here is to bring his love and his reconciliation. And I have to be able to do that within my own heart. I have to be able to forgive. I have to be able to love all of God's children no matter what they've done. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't think any of us here today have been called for that type of sacrifice. Yet. But if you can't love those who are around you in the peaceful conditions that we have today, how will you possibly do it when things really start to turn around? What he did when he looked out at the people and he looked at the condition and he saw the pain and the hurt and the suffering and he realized that there were people within his own congregation that not only killed his family, but also there were those there that killed other members of other people's families and he had to be Jesus to them. And he did. And what that took was prayer, self-sacrifice, and a relationship with God like he never had before. But he put his trust and his faith in Christ, and Christ did not let him down. And that church is thriving today. Reconciliation was brought to the people. And they were able to put those things aside, and they were able to truly heal and move forward. It can happen there, it can happen anywhere. When we look, the greatest healing that needs to take place isn't between a brother and sister in church. The greatest healing that needs to be uh, taking place is here inside of you. If you don't heal, if you don't allow the Holy Spirit to mend your heart, then you can never be reconciled to your brother, your sister, your family, or anybody else. Unfathomable love. Let the love of God that is poured out on us through His Son, Jesus Christ, let that touch you. Let it touch you deeply. But to do that, you have to have a living, thriving prayer life and relationship with Him. It won't come any other way.
So we looked at Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 12. Sometimes we hear these verses so much that they don't mean anything to us anymore. But I want you to understand that God demonstrates His own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread through all men, that through this man, Jesus Christ, we now have reconciliation. And it's not just for those who believe in His name, it's for the entire world. The world has been reconciled into Christ, and the world needs to know that. How will they know if they do not hear? How will they hear if someone is not sent? Will you be one of those that are sent? Will you go and will you share Christ to those in your world? Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Unfathomable love. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. These are familiar verses. You ever wonder what God thinks about you? You ever wonder with everything that you've done, all the things in your past, do you ever wonder how He can love you? See, I know, as I said before, I can understand why He can love you guys. Okay? The why He can love me, I don't know, because I know me. I know the things that I've done. And I'm sure you guys can say the same thing. You know what you've done. You know how many times you've disappointed Him. You know how many times you've failed Him. But do you ever wonder what God thinks about you? Jeremiah 29, verse 11, answers that question. Jeremiah writes, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of what? <laughs> Listen again. When you hear those, those words and those thoughts in your head of condemnation, that's not God. That is the devil. And you need to be able to push that aside and cling to God's voice and realize that the thoughts God has for you is thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Turn with me to... Uh, Jeremiah 31, look at verse 3. Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with what kind of love? What does that mean, everlasting? Uh, <laughs> Do you realize that before any of you here were even born, before this word was even created, God knew who you were. God knew what color hair you had. God knew how long your days would be, whether you would live long or whether your life would be short. And God knew everything you would ever do before you were even created. Think about that. God knew everything that Lucifer would ever do and all the pain that he would suffer. And yet God created him anyway. And do you realize that God never took him to the side and said, do you know what you're going to do? God loved him. And God showed him his abundant, unfathomable love. But God let him choose his own path because that's what love is. Right? Amen. God never forces. This is the difference between the devil's tactics and God's tactics. You see the picture that Jesus is standing at the door knocking? You familiar with that picture? Is there a door handle no. on the outside of that door? That's right. Jesus knocks. The devil uses force, fear, coercion. That's the tools of the devil. This is why fear works so well. And this is why God gives us not the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power and the spirit of love that comes through the Son, Jesus Christ. But what God does is wait and he knocks and he woos and he loves. But he gives us the freedom to choose to accept him and to let him in. Now listen, brothers and sisters, when we let him in, oh, he comes. He comes in, and he promises you, I'll stay here. As long as you want me here, I'll stay. But he's a gentleman. 
And if we say leave, he'll leave. But listen, he won't leave forever. And he won't go far. Right? Because he's always loving. He's always wooing. And he's always loving. Why? Because it doesn't matter what you're doing. 